Hello and welcome to the first Timeless in Texas virtual event of the spring presented by the Dallas Morning News. We are so glad that all of you have joined us today. We are going to begin by, by showing everyone a pre-recorded video of our expert panelists. And this video is about 25 minutes long. And at the end of that video, all of our panelists are going to join us live. Uh, for a question and answer session uh, with questions asked by all of you in the audience. So our experts today include Tim Mallard, who is the CEO of Forefront Living, Virginia Hammerly with Hammerly Finley Law Group, and Dr. Ronan Kelly, who is the Chief of Oncology at Baylor Scott and White Health. Um, as, as a reminder, everyone is able to ask follow up questions um, of the panelists during the pre recorded segment by using the chat function that you can find in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So, again, thanks for joining us today and we will see everyone back for the question and answer session. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ron Corning. Thank you for joining us for the spring 2021 timeless in Texas virtual event. It's where we delve into issues related to those who are 55 and older, how to live well, be well, and do well. And how you live and where you live is a very important part of that. We want to bring in now our first guest, Tim Mallett. He's the CEO of Forefront Living. Tim, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ron. Describe for me, if you can, um, who is Forefront? What is Forefront Living? Yeah, Forefront Living is a not-for-profit organization that's primary focus is senior living, but offers an array of services that range from a continuing care or retirement community for seniors through certain post-acute uh, services for the general public. What is, when you talk about continuing care retirement community, what does that mean exactly? So typically, if you're looking at a retirement community, a continuing care retirement community is, is a retirement community that offers all levels of living for seniors who are typically 60 plus and above, ranging from the most independent of living, uh, a home type setting, or perhaps an apartment, all the way through uh, assisted living, memory care, and uh, rehab and skilled nursing. So when you talk about Presbyterian Village North, who would benefit from living in that community specifically? Well, I think it appeals to a broad range of individuals because it addresses that continuum. So uh, a, a very independent, youthful senior who's interested in a lifestyle choice, perhaps, as well as somebody that uh, would like or enjoy another level of care, such as assisted living or may have advanced needs, such as memory support or uh, short-term rehab needs, it could be addressed in uh, the skilled nursing area. So in terms of actually beginning the process of exploring retirement living options, what age would you say someone should start thinking about it? That's an interesting question because as you know, the child of a senior, I always say even someone in their 50s should be looking at this to begin future planning, not just for themselves, but for their parents. Strongly encourage individuals who are... Um, either recently retired or thinking about retirement to look at this as a lifestyle choice and begin planning that very early and not look at it as a need-based uh, move, but a lifestyle choice. And you're already seeing growth at Presbyterian Village North, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Presbyterian Village North or PVN, as we like to call ourselves, has been in existence for just a little over 40 years. And the campus has been in a constant state of redevelopment. And we're very fortunate that we're uh, actually constructing another 112 units of independent living on the on the campus. It's called the Hawthorne, and it's named after Doug Hawthorne, and many of you will know his name uh, from THR, who was really the visionary who founded Presbyterian Village North. Uh, people who are listening might be wondering, do you have to be of the Presbyterian faith in order to, to live at the village? No, you do not. While Presbyterian is in our name, uh, one of our core values is diversity, and, and that very much applies to faith and in every sense of the word. So we were founded in the Presbyterian tradition, which is a very open tradition as it is to all faiths. Um, let's talk about this for a moment. What would, how would you sketch out or describe for somebody what a typical day living at PVM would be like? Well, it's all about the individual. And it, it's about meeting 
you where you are. It's about thriving. If it were me, it might not start till two or three in the afternoon. But uh, typically, especially in the independent living area, there's a full array of, of different activities, events. And I think in particular, the opportunity for the socialization piece, the opportunity to be with neighbors and friends. Uh, more than likely, most of our residents start the day with exercise. We have a tremendous wellness program that ranges from multiple swimming pool locations to exercise and fitness areas and our personal trainers available. And, and of course, there are a lot of happy hours and, and different uh, other opportunities to socialize as well as cultural events. I can't probably go on and on with yeah, this. Can't argue with, with that. However, socializing and other activities, I know you've probably been impacted there at PVN as people have been everywhere by the pandemic. Um, how have you met those challenges in that community specifically? You know, PVN has fared very well during the pandemic and, and we have a tremendous group of residents. And when, um, the pandemic first struck and you hear about all of these communities that close their gates and close their gates to visitation. The one thing that didn't happen there was the isolation that everyone else experienced because as those gates closed, you were still in your community. You were still with your neighbors. You still had a team uh, there for you. And should you have any sort of needs, and we were very fortunate to have had a COVID unit in place. It was the first one in the city to serve individuals as well. So it worked out I think very well for PVN. And you've got growth at PVN, but you're also expanding up to Plano. Describe for me what that expansion looks like. Well, that, that's going to be incredible. We were uh, very fortunate to find one of the last uh, non-developed parcels in Plano, right across from Windhaven Park, and we're building another continuing care retirement community on that site. So, so why Plano? I, I mean, we know it's an area of expansion an aging population there as well? Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, it, it is as a very healthy aging population, a good group of seniors uh, that are really, I think at the point in their lives where they're in early retirement and they're looking for that lifestyle choice that I talked about earlier. Uh, and Plano is a perfect market for that. So you've been able to focus on growth because the needs of our aging population haven't changed even while some businesses have been impacted by the pandemic. Yeah, we're all another year older. So, uh, and I think that's what has been very interesting is that the trends have continued, the aging has continued, but that desire since the pandemic for community, for social interaction, for camaraderie, for lifestyle has only increased, especially since things have eased just a bit recently. Yeah, so in talking about, this is the outlook at Windhaven, correct, that we're talking about? That is correct. Yeah, so... What has the initial response been as people have gotten word that this expansion is happening in that area? Um, people started expressing interest before we even opened our marketing office. We were getting calls here at Forefront Living uh, from individuals who wanted to learn about it, wanted to be part of it. And that was, that was very refreshing for us because it demonstrated that there was that need and there was that desire. Uh, and many of them had, of course, um, experiences with uh, our other levels of living and other entities in the Metroplex. So it's been fantastic. Well, Tim, congratulations on your expansion and on being able to help uh, folks who are living in your communities get through this pandemic as you have. We appreciate it. Tim Mallet is the CEO of Forefront Living. Thank you very much. You bet. The Hawthorne, Presbyterian Village North's newest senior living neighborhood is now taking reservations. Now under construction, the Hawthorne will offer spacious residences situated on PVN's thriving 66-acre campus in North Dallas. Over 75% have already been sold, so act now for best selection and special incentives. Call 866-20-THRIVE or visit thrive at pvn.org to schedule your appointment today. And we are back now with Virginia Hammerly of Hammerly Finley Law Firm. Virginia, always good to see you. Thank you for being a part of this discussion. It's always my pleasure. Uh, we promised people we would help them with both the legal and financial navigation of getting older and making sure that people have what they need in order to live their, their absolute best lives. You're all about pre-planning, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. But give me some sense, if you will, oftentimes... The first phone call you get from a family is a family in crisis with nowhere to turn, and they realize 
they haven't taken the right steps for a family member who maybe is in need. What does that look like when that call comes in? Well, the first thing I'm going to ask them is a little bit about the family relationships that they have and whether or not the person who is in crisis is able to talk to me. If not, then we're going to go a completely different path. But if the person who is in crisis is able to talk to me, then I'm going to be ascertaining what their wishes are. If they don't have documents in place, we're going to put some documents in place. Mm. What sort of documents can you put in place when somebody is, is literally right there at a crossroads and in need of medical care that they realize they're not covered for or options that simply aren't available to them? So the entire estate planning spectrum takes that into consideration from the very beginning until actually the end stages of any kind of illness. We're going to take a look at powers of attorney, both medical and durable, and those are going to be, I mean, those are, those are just required documents. Mm -hmm. um, a HIPAA release, of course, but a directive to physicians. We want to know what their wishes are when the end stages come. At some point, depending on where they are in the journey, they're going to ask me a question about living wills. They're going to ask about uh, a physician statement, a directive not to resuscitate. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll go through the specifics of those that they have to be doctor created and that they're in stage. We are also going to talk about finances. It's very important that people have at least a thought in place as to how they're going to pay for those in stage times. And some people who don't have the means, you're able to direct them to social programs or, or other such programs that might allow pay for care? Absolutely. So if somebody uh, is 65 or older, of course, they're eligible for Medicare. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they've got uh, some kind of auxiliary program in place to supplement their Medicare to pay for those additional services. So they're not having to come up with a lot of out-of-pocket costs. Sometimes we do Medicaid planning and Medicaid planning, of course, is a federal state program that will pay for people who are eligible, and that means by asset and by income, to uh, pay for the end stages when they have a need for nursing home level care. So we'll talk about Medicaid planning and we'll also talk about Medicaid planning avoidance. Mm -hmm. If we can work with them on their uh, projected income, if we can talk to them about uh, their expenses and how possibly they can deduct those, so that their income level stays at a rate where they can private pay, then we have those discussions. Hopefully somebody has in place some long-term care insurance. So we're gonna talk about uh, what they have available on their options with long-term care insurance. And of course, we'll talk about their private insurance that they have, hopefully. Um, and then if all else fails with that, because we should be able to get on the spectrum as we go through that, then we're going to talk with them about social workers and also some nonprofit agencies to see what's available out there in the marketplace. Well, it's interesting because we've just painted a picture for perhaps a family, as we said, in crisis that's reached this point, not understanding all that comes with it, all the decisions that have to be made and all of the criteria that go into finding a nursing home for a loved one. Let's rewind a bit and use that as a cautionary tale, a cautionary hypothetical for other families out there to avoid that. Early on, when they are either independently aware of their aging, of course we all should be, right? Um, or family members are concerned about an elderly parent, a parent who's aging. Take us through some of the steps. You mentioned some of the documents. What is the difference, for example, between an advanced directive, a DNR, and a living will? So an advanced directive uh, is actually the same thing as a living will. Okay. In, and each state has its own requirements, but I'll focus on Texas since that's where we are right now. So in Texas, they have a statutory base form that you can enhance. And basically what it says is if one of two situations arise, then you want some kind of action taken. And remember, even though you've put in writing, you can always contradict it when it comes up. So the first one is if you have been uh, diagnosed with a terminal condition that's going to lead to your death in a very short period of time. In that case, you're saying do or do not artificially prolong my life. And that's either by feeding tube or artificial um, breathing or something along the lines that is somehow going to keep them alive. And it's the same thing if you've got an irreversible condition. And the example we use there is if you have dementia. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, if you reach the point where you can no longer make your wishes known and you come down with pneumonia or something, do you want your life artificially prolonged or do you want to be allowed to die peacefully and not in pain? So that's a directive to physician slash living will. It's given effect in Texas. It's statutorily approved uh, and it should not be used um, when uh, somebody has uh, a condition where they don't want to be resuscitated, okay? Mm -hmm. So a resuscitation, which is a do not resuscitate, is something that is created by a doctor, has to be signed by a doctor. There's two forms, one is in hospital and one is outside of a hospital. And basically what that says is if you stop breathing or your heart stops beating, don't resuscitate me. No code blue. I, I want to talk about one part of this and, and draw on some personal experience as it relates to it. So my mom, for example, um, had signed her advance directive. But there's a gray area there. And in order to determine what her wishes might have been in that situation or what her wishes were in that situation, um, it was really based on having had emotional but real conversations with her when she was lucid. There's There was part of it that said, um, I don't want to continue living under these conditions if the prognosis is that my quality of life would be diminished to a certain point. Well, how do you determine for somebody else what their quality of life, what's a good quality of life or what is not? And I felt like I had a pretty good handle on how she would want to make that decision. But again, that comes down to not just a legal document, Virginia, but real conversations that family members have to have with their loved ones. And that's not easy. It's never easy to have that conversation. I always encourage people to do so, but we will facilitate the conversation. There's been a number of clients where I've asked them to bring in their kids and ask them to bring in the agents that they have under a medical power of attorney and we'll sit around the table and I'll go over the documents with them and I'll say, okay, guys, this is your responsibility. And then I will turn to my client and say, what do you wanna have happen in these cases? And they may not have the full conversation in my office in front of me, but it sure does open up um, the way for them to have that conversation at a later time. So it just makes it so much easier. It's such a wonderful gift to give to your family members so that they're not guessing and that there's no dispute uh, at the end stage. I don't know how to say this because you and I have had uh, several conversations, but um, I sense that you're a lawyer with heart. Are those things mutually exclusive? <laughs> because you do connect with the emotional part of this. And I'm not sure every attorney connects with the emotional part of this, like you just said, facilitating a difficult conversation. Do you sometimes feel like um, you're good at what you do because you're as much a counselor, an emotional counselor, as you are um, a legal eagle, so to speak? You know, I, I went into this specialty. Uh, I was doing a lot of bank litigation and corporate litigation. And that's something that uh, if you're a lawyer and you ever had a heart, it will kind of tear it down. So I went into this because I wanted to connect more with people. I hope it's helpful for them uh, to have these conversations. But I feel very personally, I feel very satisfied when I'm able to bring a family together to have that kind of conversation. Boy, I wish I'd known you before we dealt with the stuff we did in our family, even though we made it through um, as best we could. Virginia, thank you very much. Virginia Hammerly is with Hammerly Finley Law Firm. Always a pleasure to talk to her. And again, to navigate all of this, it's not just about the legal part of it. It's about making sure you connect in an emotional way with that family member in crisis or who could be someday in crisis. You want to have a plan in place. We'll be back right after this. So while all eyes of the medical world were on COVID-19 research, cancer research didn't stop. And right here in North Texas, there's breaking news that will impact the future of cancer care. Dr. Ronan Kelly is the chief of oncology for Baylor Scott and White Health in North Texas and is joining us to talk about a new advancement, how it led to longer survival for the patients involved and how it's being called by experts a game changer for cancer care, adding a new tool beyond the typical radiation and chemotherapy. Dr. Kelly, thank you for joining us. 
Well, thank you so much for having me. And, and we said it here that a lot of the focus in the last year has been on COVID-19, the disease itself, the research, but thousands of North Texans still during that time have been battling and will be battling cancer. Share with us the latest news from Baylor Scott and White. Well, you're absolutely correct. You know, the, the whole world now knows about the importance of our immune system in the fight against disease. You know, we've been seeing on the news every night about how important our immune system is in fighting that virus, with some people getting no symptoms and others getting really sick. Well, what I'm here to tell you today is it's just as important in the fight against cancer. Those underlying immune cells that we have are the reason why some people can do very well and some people not so well. And so all of the efforts in cancer now are going on to turn on a patient's immune system to kind of wage a molecular war, if you will, between the bad cells, which are your cancer cells, and your good cells, which are your immune cells. Uh, and you've launched a new program, I understand, and I'm just going to, I'm going to use the, the, the initials T-I-O-B, um, that you say will help accelerate cancer research. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, you know, Baylor Scott and White is the largest not-for-profit health system in Texas. And we want to we want to harness that power um, to start collecting uh, biological samples from patients across multiple diverse patient population backgrounds, multiple racial, social, and ethnic backgrounds. You might say, why you want to do that? Well, because the power to fight cancer lies within all of us, and as a result of new technologies, we can actually understand how a cancer is trying to hide from your immune system now by taking samples of blood or even samples of urine. And so what we're asking now is for our patients, can we partner with them? So entire, throughout their entire journey with cancer, can we understand how their immune system is evolving to keep up an ever-changing tumor? And, to, and doing that, we will identify weaknesses in cancer that we can use then to create the next generation of cancer treatments. So that's what the Texas Immuno-Oncology Biorepository is all about. And we know we're fortunate here in North Texas to have so many great options for medical care, but Baylor University Medical Center is more than just a teaching hospital, as I understand it. It's an academic medical center as, as well. Can you explain what that means and what the benefits are for patients? Absolutely. Well, you know, the Charles A. Salmons Cancer Center down here at Baylor University Medical Center is one of the largest cancer centers in the nation. We have so many firsts here. In fact, we have the only dedicated cancer hospital uh, for patients. We have a 24-hour urgent care, and we have the soon-to-open Gene and Jerry Jones American Cancer Society Hope Lodge. But I really wanted to emphasize that we're becoming, and we are, a major immunotherapy center. And just last week, we published in the New England Journal of Medicine a practice-changing study involving immunotherapy treatments for patients with esophageal cancer, which is going to give them significant hope. That study is called Checkmate 577. I had the privilege of leading this around the world. And it, in addition to making it into the New England Journal of Medicine, it was uh, on the front cover of the Dallas Morning News, and it also made it over to the New York Times. So real practice-changing studies emerging here from at Baylor University Medical Center. No, it's remarkable and something to be proud of. And I'm wondering, as we close, close <clears throat> this segment, is there anything specifically that you want readers to know about those who are 55 and older when it comes to cancer treatment and diagnosis in North Texas? Well, you know, in addition to getting everyone getting the COVID vaccine, I think that would be, that's very important. But I wanted to also tell people about, we are opening uh, the first Hope Lodge in North Texas in about a month to two months time. What does that mean? Well, it's gonna provide 18,000 nights of free accommodation. So people from around Texas can come stay with us for free with a loved one in, in beautiful accommodations and get their treatments here. And then they can go back home to their, their local doctors for continuation of care. And that's gonna be named after Gene and Jerry Jones. It's called the Gene and Jerry Jones American Cancer Society Hope Lodge. I think it's a game changer for North Texas because we've never had this before. And hopefully more patients will be able to avail of these amazing scientific breakthroughs that are happening across our system. Well, we certainly hope so. Dr. Ronan Kelly, the Chief of Oncology for Baylor Scott and White Health in North Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, what a great panel. Thank you so much again uh, to our experts. Um, Y'all shared such fantastic information uh, as usual. So um, while we are waiting for our um, experts to jump back on with their videos uh, to, to do the live Q&A, um, I want to recognize them again. So uh, Tim Mallet, the CEO of Forefront Living, and Virginia Hammerly of Hammerly Finley Law Firm um, are here. And we do know that Dr. Kelly is not going to be here until right about 2.30. Um, so, so some of the questions that we have for him, we're going to hold. Uh, so welcome, Tim and Virginia. Thank you so much uh, for being on our panel. So um, I also, too, really quickly, if you have a question or as we are going through um, this part of the Q&A with the, the panels, the panelists, if you have a question, you can still ask uh, your question using the chat function, again, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. So um, a question for Tim. So. What? Uh, for front living, is it possible to make a reservation with either the Hawthorne or Windhaven properties without committing to a specific move in date? In other words, what if you're not interested in moving in in the next 10 to 15 years, but possibly shortly thereafter? Is there any way to lock down current prices to use in the future? Uh, that's a multi-part question. So uh, uh, the first part is I, I think it's always a good idea to come in and look at any time uh, if you're you're not ready uh, to move in. But for information purposes, we have a lot of people, especially for people who are planning, it's a good idea to visit not just us, but to, to visit retirement communities in general to get a sense of, of what you may want. Um, as far as future deposits, uh, we we would not be taking a deposit for 15 years down the road, uh, but there are currently uh, availability to participate in the early phases of the discussion for the outlook at Windhaven as well as the Hawthorne. So uh, the Hawthorne is still you know about 18 months out before opening, and then the outlook is a few years out. So that may work with the time frame for somebody who's looking for something in, in not the very distant future, but perhaps uh, the more near future. Hope that uh, hit on all the points of the question. Okay, well, I think it did. And, and for the person who did ask that question, if it did not, feel free to send any follow-up questions. Um, and hello, Dr. Kelly, thanks for joining us. Great hello, to see you. Morning. <laughs> so, um, okay, next question for uh, Virginia. So, um, is an inheritance considered community property in Texas? Generally, no. That's, I mean, that's the answer. So inheritance, gift, uh, anything that you brought into a marriage, those are all considered separate property. The trick is once you receive an inheritance to put it in some kind of form so that it stays separate property because the income that comes off an inheritance, if it's an investment, is going to be considered community property. Okay, so a follow up question to that is what can a parent do to protect a child's inheritance from that child's spouse? Well, first, you have to uh, make sure you guide your child to pick the right spouse. Very important. But just in case your child wasn't listening, which does happen occasionally, uh, the usual thing to do is to put it in a trust. And once you put it in a trust and you designate someone else as the trustee, that trustee is going to dole the money out. It's not going to be considered part of uh, the child's uh, either separate property or community estate. And that way you make sure that the inheritance stays separate. Okay, great. Thank you, Virginia. Um, okay, Dr. Kelly. Okay. Um, what about the COVID-19 vaccine? Are you advising patients going through cancer treatment to get vaccinated? And will the vaccine interfere with treatment? No, no, the vaccine won't interfere with treatment. And yes, we're advising every patient to get vaccinated uh, who has cancer. I think the, the information is quite clear coming from all the national guidelines, all the national committees that cancer patients are one of the more at risk patient populations. 
because of immune, immunosuppression that happens with some of their treatments. And so we are advising all cancer patients to get vaccinated. Okay, great, thank you. Um, a follow-up question for that too is, um, how were cancer screenings affected during the pandemic and what is the future for cancer screenings? What are, what are y'all seeing in that space? All around the world, we saw a dramatic decrease in people attending for screenings. You know, they were, people were just afraid to come into their hospitals and into their doctor's offices. Thankfully now, certainly in the US, that we're seeing that changing dramatically. We're seeing women attending for their mammograms and, uh, you know, all the other screenings that we have. So I think that's back to normal. What's the future for screenings? The future for screenings, believe it or not, is in actually blood-based detection whereby you can take a sample of blood from a patient and determine the molecular, small little tiny pieces of cancer that may be in circulating in a bloodstream. We can detect those now. So that is that, that test is, is just emerging. Um, we only have, we can only screen for five cancers in the United States, but with this blood test, we think we can screen for the 50 most common cancers. And that could be part of your annual primary care doctor visit. So. It's not quite ready yet. They're just emerging this data, but that's the future where you go to your primary care doc, you'll give a sample of blood, and they're gonna be able to tell you whether you've got very early cancer. And so you can go and get it treated, hopefully before it ever becomes a big problem. Wow, that's fascinating. That's exciting news. Very exciting news. It's, it's what we've all been waiting for, right? Because we all know that if we can treat these diseases earlier, patient outcomes are so much better. And that's one of the things we're doing here at Baylor. We've launched this very large statewide initiative called the Texas Immuno-Oncology Biorepository, which basically means we're telling all of our patients when they come in, can we partner with you to understand how the human immune system changes over time so that we can learn how the weakness is in cancer and we can learn how to detect cancer much earlier. And we are seeing amazing uptake from our patients. I think the COVID pandemic, if it's done anything, it's educated the world about how important our immune system is and people just get it now. So we're seeing uh, patients coming into our clinics. We're asking, can we take a sample of blood? Can we even do urine? Imagine we could in the future be able to detect breast cancer from a simple urine test. That's what we're trying to do. And I think that's where the exciting future is for cancer. Yes, that is, that's great information. Thank you. And that is very exciting. So again, if, if anybody has follow up questions as we're going through the Q and a, please submit them. Um, Tim, another question for you. Um, what are important things to consider for someone who is looking to move into a retirement community? You know, I would very much encourage people to look at who owns it or who is sponsoring it. Uh, I, I think when you arrive and you're touring, pay close attention to first impressions, general upkeep, uh, and try and interact with staff. Uh, I, I think one of the best things to do is if you know somebody, uh, talk to someone who lives there, talk to someone who's associated with the organization. Uh, more and more uh, in our corporate office, we get um, questions uh, from family members and from prospective residents. And we, we really enjoy getting to have that interaction. I think it's, it's very important to have a good feel uh, for what you're doing. And this is a long-term decision, so it's worth the investment of that time. Okay, absolutely. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, okay, another question for Virginia. Um, what does it cost to set up a trust fund? Is there a minimum? Um, so I'm not sure if that's like the cost or how much money needs to be in a trust fund. Uh, should it be set up prior to the estate owner passing? So assuming that what you're talking about is to set up a trust and then fund the trust with some kind of assets, the cost of the trust is going to depend on what kind of terms we're going to have in it, whether it's a specialty trust or not. But generally, you should look at a cost somewhere between 2500 and 8000 uh, And that is if it's uh, basically a flat fee. Sometimes attorneys will charge by the hour, depending on how complicated it uh, needs to be. In terms of funding it, if you want a professional to fund it, like a bank or a trust company, they're going to require at least $500,000 in liquidity to be funded into the trust. 
if you just want an individual to serve as the trustee, then any amount of money could be funded into it. And whether or not it's funded during someone's lifetime just depends on whether or not they want to control it and have it uh, the bequest go by the trust terms during their lifetime or whether they want an extra step by either uh, the will pouring over assets into the trust or maybe a beneficiary designation on an account or an investment. Okay, great. Thank you, Virginia. Um, okay, another question for Dr. Kelly. So um, the TIOB program that you talked about, does someone have to be enrolled in a clinical trial to be able to participate in this? No, it's, it, this is actually one of the problems we have in the United States is only 5% of all, po all our population participates in a trial. Most of those patients tend to be, you know, middle class upwards. They can move to academic centers. So we're missing out on 95% of Americans. Americans with real world conditions like COPD, heart failure, AFib, they're excluded from many trials. So the TIOB, which we've launched across the Baylor Scott and White Health System is saying, Okay, how can we learn about the immune system in real Americans, real Texans from multiple backgrounds, multiple comorbidities, so we can learn what's happening in real world patients? And it's one of the few systems in the United States that's doing that. And I think it's, it's a total game changer for us and hopefully will result in many, many more advances in, for not just in Texas, but for patients all around the world. Okay. So then could someone just see their physician at Baylor, Scott and White and, and ask to be a part of this program then? Yeah, so what we're doing is uh, we've started with uh, breast cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, kidney and bladder, um, and esophageal and gastric cancer. Now we're, you know, they're common cancers. We're going to open it and cross other ones uh, over the next couple of months and years. But the process is anyone that's going for a surgery we asked them, would they like to be involved in this partnership? We don't call this research. We say, will you be a partner with us so we can learn how your immune system is trying to keep up to date with a tumor if ever it tries to come back? And I think our patients just understand that we're getting 70 to 80% of patients are saying, sure, I want to be part of this because it'll help me, but it'll also help my neighbor or my family future generations. And so people are really excited about this. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, another question for Tim. All right, what are the time elements for opening the Hawthorne and the outlook at Windhaven? Oops, Tim. There you are. I think you are muted. Or is my screen frozen? I am here. Uh, oh, there you are. Okay. Can you hear we me? Can hear you. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Now, I, uh, the time elements, is that what you said, the time frame? Yes, for the Hawthorne and the Outlook at Windhaven. Yeah, well, we'll start with the Outlook at Windhaven. Uh, 2024 is the expected opening of the independent living um, <clears throat> at uh, the Outlook at Windhaven, and the Hawthorne will be ready for occupancy uh, in 2022. So we're about 16 months, 15 months away. Uh, from that uh, expected first resident. Okay, perfect. And then a follow up to that question is, do you have to qualify in some way to move into Presbyterian Village North or uh, the Outlook at Windhaven mm -hmm. or the Hawthorne? So I get the fun multi-part questions here. Um, yes, uh, the both entities are uh, entry fee based. So there is, um, an income or uh, disclosure that happens on the independent living side. And as you go to the highest levels of care, uh, such as whether it's the inpatient hospice uh, section or uh, skilled nursing, then you would have some insurance uh, qualifications if you're going down that route and income qualifications if you were going private pay. Okay, all right, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, another question for Virginia. Um, if you are named the executor of a will, do you need to hire an attorney? After the principal of a will passes away, yes. You will not be able to do the probate uh, process in court without an attorney. And the reason is you're an agent. So you're a fiduciary. And because you personally are not an attorney, you will not be able to represent, say, the estate 
or if you were suing on behalf of a trust, the trust. So one of the first things you need to do after someone passes away is number one, find the original will and number two, make an appointment with an attorney to discuss what options are out there for probate. Okay. All right, and then let's see, we've got another question for Dr. Kelly. So, um, which patients with esophageal, did I say that correctly, cancer are now eligible for immunotherapy? Um, sure. Yeah, no, so, you know, there's a team here, right? Because I'm talking about immunotherapy and I'll just say what people, what is that? Well, the whole world is getting vaccinated now against COVID, right? To boost your immune cells, to fight that terrible virus. Well, we're doing the exact same thing in cancer. We're giving medications that can boost your immune system to wage a molecular war between your cancer cells and your immune cells, which are your good cells. And so this study that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine last week was a game changer for esophageal patients. Anyone with operable esophageal cancer, stage two or stage three, we gave them the standard treatment of chemo radiation, and then they had surgery, part of their esophagus was removed. And the, the study was we gave them a year of an immunotherapy after their surgery, and they doubled their survival. Uh, so it was the biggest advance we've ever seen in esophageal cancer. And it shows you the power to beat cancer lies within us. It's in our immune system like it is to beat this virus. We just give the correct medications and we can turn on the immune cells to wage this war. And that's how we're going to control cancer moving forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so that is bringing us to the end of the questions that we have. So if anybody has any other questions, uh, last questions that you want to put through uh, the chat, you can do it now. And then uh, Dr. Kelly, Virginia, Tim, do you have any final thoughts or anything else you'd like to, to share to the attendees before we uh, close out this panel? No, th thank you for the invitation. You know, I, I think um, just from with cancer, you know, if people are feeling nervous or anxious, just be rest assured, come in and see us because the quicker we can start your treatment, the better. Don't put things off and get your vaccines and we look after your cancer. So thank you. Thank you. Virginia or Tim. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here, Heather, and uh, a little bit like the doctor. I'd like to say if somebody is facing some kind of legal issue or does not have a state plan in place, don't put it off. Let's get it done now while we still can. Okay. And Virginia, really quickly, following up on a meeting that actually you and I had earlier today, if someone has recently moved to the state of Texas from somewhere else, do they need to have any of their estate planning paperwork looked at as a new resident of Texas, or is that some of the documents that may not have to be revised after moving to another state? It's a great idea to have an appointment with an attorney and look over all of those documents. Every state has its own peculiarities. Some states have things in place like California that may not be necessary to have in place in Texas. And so we want to do everything we can to streamline things here in Texas and make sure that your documents are going to be accepted by the courts and the hospitals and the doctors and the banks when the time comes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Tim, finally, any last thoughts? Yeah, I just, you know, uh, having had a chance to meet uh, my co-panelists, I think the common thread in all of this for anybody watching is that all these decisions are in our control and it's best to be proactive and involved in them. So I'm excited to be a part of such a great panel. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And thank you again so much to all of our panelists and to everyone who has joined us. Uh, we will have a second spring panel uh, that is going to be on May the 12th. So be on the lookout for information on how to RSVP for that panel. And we're going to have a uh, brand new experts uh, that will be joining us for that event. So uh, thank you again to everyone and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks very much.